Thanks for joining us for season three of the Stories Unveiled podcast. Stories Unveiled exists to create a platform for people to share hope through their personal stories of what Jesus does in their life. Each episode highlights a different guest, just like you and I, wading through this life that can get so messy. I hope this conversation proves helpful and encourages you to go live unveiled. Today, I have Nathaniel Smith in the studio with me. Nathaniel is the pastor of Limitless Church with a passion for seeing unity within the body of Christ. He founded an organization called In Hope and hosts a podcast with the same name. Our conversation today will share a glimpse into Nathaniel's story and his heart for God's people. Thanks for being here, Nathaniel. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. So I want to start first with, tell me about In Hope. Tell me about this organization that you started. So In Hope is a dream taking form. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it is something that has really been on my heart ever since I was about 16. Okay. So I first came to relationship with Jesus when I was a freshman in high school. Okay. I was 13 and... My brother invited me to a, a youth group and I went because it was better than hanging out in the motel room. Showed so, <laughs> okay. and, uh, but God just really got a hold of my heart and got really involved with the church there, had a great core group of friends, and we really got involved in ministry there. Mm -hmm. And slowly my heart really started shifting from I want to play sports mm -hmm. when I grow up uh, to I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve God and serve in ministry. And these visions, um, ideas just kept on coming to me. I had a notebook where I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down and really put it all under this umbrella mm -hmm. of this this title of, of house of prayer is what it was. And in that, a big focus was I want to see the body of Christ become stronger in unity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because I played sports growing up. I'm not sure exactly where all the dominoes came together. Right. But it was just really impressed on my heart that we need to see greater unity in the church. I know... Uh, in the I, church. In the church. Big the C. big C yeah. church. Um, when I... Actually, when I first became a Christian, mm -hmm. I, I felt like a whole new world opened up. Okay. So, for example, at my high school, there was actually a big Christian bookstore just right down the street. Okay. I mean, really, one, you go down to the next main street right there, and in that shopping center was a big Christian bookstore. Okay. I never had any idea that was there. Really? Never had any you idea. looking for it. I wasn't right? looking wasn't, for it, exactly. Yeah. Wasn't looking for it. And so there were a lot of things like that where I felt like, okay, I'm starting to, mm -hmm. to find out and get a sense of so much that's out there mm -hmm. that's beneficial for believers. And part of that, that urge to see stronger unity was possibly this idea of, we can do so much together. Yeah, we have, better together. We, we are, we really are better together. We have so many great things out there, but it seems like so many of us are trying to go at it alone. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you run into some things, you're like, everybody needs to know about this. So why doesn't everyone know this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then sure. so part of that was just, how can we start working together more? How can we start making sure everyone knows about all these great opportunities, all these great ministries, all, you know, these great messages yeah. and, and different things like that. And so my my desire from very young, from 16, 17, was, okay, let's do something to help strengthen unity in the body of Christ. Okay. And so everything that I've done really since then, in one way or another, has been with that mindset and that focus of leading towards that. Yeah. And then earlier this year, I stepped away from a great, job with the state and, you know, the, the benefits and the good package and whatnot. To, so what made sense, right? It, it made sense. Right. It absolutely made yeah. sense. And me okay. and my wife, we prayed and thought about it. We've had our 
back and forths and struggles with it, but we saw a window of opportunity and we decided, okay, we're going to take this. Mm -hmm. And so earlier this year, just kind of jumped in full force and trying to build some momentum behind the ministry now to help strengthen unity in the body of Christ. That's awesome. So what types of things do you do within Hope? Because there's... Um, the widow's well. There's widow's is well. well. Yeah. Okay. There's, there, there's widow's well. There's one. There's there's the podcast, like mm -hmm. you mentioned. Yeah. So you have and a podcast. Really, it boils down to two things. Want to teach about unity. Okay. Um. So help us to grow in this understanding of what does biblical unity look like. Mm -hmm. We can throw out a term like unity, and yeah. there's going to be lots of variation on what people think that means. Yeah. And so. <laughs> yeah. And so we want to have that conversation. Just what does biblical unity look like? Mm -hmm. What are ways that we can grow stronger in that unity? Mm -hmm. And then, so the podcast is a big part of that. I also, write some blogs. Yeah. Um, I'm working on a dissertation right now that wow. actually focuses on unity within local churches and and how believers can be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And then so we're investing in this aspect of let's teach about unity. Let's learn about it and grow an understanding of what biblical unity is together. Okay. And then the other side of that, we teach about unity and side two is we want to invest in collaborative efforts. Yeah. Um, collaboration is a big part of it, obviously. Yeah. If we want to be unified, that means we're going to work alongside of each other. Mm -hmm. We're going to help each other out. And so areas that we can, we try to invest in collaboration. Yeah. Um, right now we have a pretty small pocketbook. Yeah, <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> so, um, so while we we are able to give a little bit here and there to different things, for example, we we go to Row 116 events. Right. Um, great, you know, collaborative effort mm -hmm. for the body of Christ. So we go um, and we donate to that. Uh, we just donated and had a booth set up at the God and Country Festival in yeah. 2024. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. those little things that we can do and give tours to be a part of, we want to come and be yeah. at the Stories yeah. Unveiled conference. <laughs> and, yeah, so there'll be a so, Stories Unveiled. <laughs> right, and so those things we want to be able to invest in when we can. Yeah. And uh, also if we can come alongside of organizations yeah. and say, we may not have the money that we would like to, to put towards it, but... If How we can we put, yeah, if we can put our, our hands and feet towards it, give mm -hmm. some time, then we're going to do that. Yeah. And so probably the biggest example of that is a Convoy of Hope event. Okay. We're trying to have a Convoy of Hope event yeah. for Idaho, for Southern Idaho. Okay. And we're hoping that that will happen in 2025. Yeah. And then that would be something to where we've had conversations with lots of churches in the area. Mm -hmm. And one of the big concerns was we don't have a staff member we can dedicate to this. Yeah. And so we said, hey, we'll, we'll put the time, effort, and yeah. energy towards that. That's awesome. What I love and I think is so beautiful about this idea of unity, because um, I want to just go back for a second. You were like, everybody has their own yeah. you know, definition of unity, <laughs> which is funny because, it, it, I mean, you shouldn't. But mm -hmm. the word unity can lend itself to several different things. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, what I think is so beautiful is that um, we do do need to be unified in the body of Christ, but unified doesn't have to mean uniform. No, it does not mean we have to look things. the same. Yeah. <laughs> it does not mean we have to worship the same. It does not mean that we need to fall into this box. We all need to look like this box over here, right? That's exactly. not what that means. It, no. It, it, it means that we can still unite under Christ and exactly. unite under what is biblical and unite under what is truth. Yeah. But we all can do things different, you know, exactly. and um, it doesn't make it wrong. And I just, I love that. Um, I hear you. It's a huge thing that um, our home church is a big proponent of. And it's mm. amazing because on staff at our church, yeah. um, they're the way they do things, so to speak, their their theology that are, I would say, little stones, right? If you uh -huh. have like the big, <laughs> the big pillars, yes. right, that are important, that have exactly. to matter and that you have yeah. to believe in all of those things. Yes. But there's small stones that yeah. like don't really, their preferences, their, you mm -hmm. know, those sorts of things. Um, everybody on staff and in leadership has a little variation of what they believe about yeah. those small stones but yet they still lead unified and so um, cool. it's beautiful. That so, is awesome. And that yeah. that's how it should be. You're completely yeah. right about that. It's not uniform. Right. I think the greatest example or the greatest illustration that we have, multiple actually, come from 
believe it or not, comes from scripture. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, who would have yeah. figured? <laughs> um, but one of those analogies scripture regularly uses is marriage. Mm-hmm. And something that I regularly tell people in premarital counseling mm-hmm. is that you have to have one and one. Mm-hmm if two are going to make one. Yeah. And by that, I, I regularly mean you have to be a whole person. Mm-hmm. You can't come into this thinking that they are going to be that other half that completes you. Right. If you aren't whole in yourself, mm-hmm. then this coming together to be one is not going to work. Right. And with that, you look at marriages and we don't automatically take on the the personality and all the demeanor and the different ways of looking at that the other person does. We regularly see people say opposites attract. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's one of those things where it actually makes the relationship stronger. Yeah. It makes that unity stronger and it makes it more complete to where... Now we're filling each other's gaps. I love, I love Rocky. Mm-hmm. And, the movies, right? I love okay. Rocky. And, I've never seen a single one. No, what? Oh, <laughs> oh. oh. sorry. I, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. There, there's this scene in Rocky where Rocky's talking with his wife's brother. Okay, and they're talking, and he says how he. He's asking what the what the deal is mm-hmm. between them and, you know, why he likes her and, yeah, okay. and how they work together. And he's like, well, you know, we, I got gaps and she got, <laughs> she's got gaps, but, but together there's no more gaps. <laughs> <laughs> and I love, look, listen. <laughs> There, there, there's movies where you can just like do a year of of sermon series off of, and Rockies are one of those. And he, when he says that, I just think that's perfect. Yeah. He's saying I have these gaps, yeah. I have these holes, these th- these areas, but so does she. Yeah. But then when we come together, mm-hmm. we're complete. Yeah. Like we we don't. And then so I think that's how it is with the church. Yeah. If we're able to appreciate that diversity. Yes. Appreciate each other's differences. I always say with people, I think every, for example, every denomination, Mm -hmm. I feel like we all have something right and we all have something wrong. Yeah. If we're willing to learn from each other and willing to work alongside of each other, we'll be able to reach the world that much better. Yeah. And I, it's something that actually has just grown in me over the last year and a half of doing this podcast. But then even before that, just doing stories unveiled is I sit and I hear people's stories all the time. And I hear really hard stories. I hear stories from people that I don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, something that the Lord's taught me is like, but that's a story that I've given them and they're my child and they love me and they follow me. It it might not look the same. And I firmly believe that you can sit down with anybody and and if you're seeking to understand and say like, help me understand, as opposed to trying to convince somebody otherwise or Mm -hmm. trying to change their mind, like how amazing is it to approach something with a help me understand mentality as opposed to, no, you listen to me. Exactly. And so um, I just think it's so beautiful. Absolutely. So. That's big. Yeah. Seek first to understand and then be understood. Yeah, it's amazing. I was having coffee with a friend is total rabbit trail, but I was having coffee with a friend last week and um, she goes to a Slavic church here in the Valley oh, cool. here. Yeah. Here in the Boise area, she goes to a Slavic church um, because she is Slavic. Mm-hmm. And so um, her and her family go, and I've known her for a really long time and she loves Jesus. And um, we, con- we are consistently like having conversations about prayer and all the mm-hmm. things. And this last time we met, I learned so much about the Slavic Christian church yeah. and their um, some of their traditions and the way they worship is so different mm-hmm. than the way I worship. And it was amazing because then it's like, we are we are not, like nothing about the way we worship is the same, nothing about, but we love the same Jesus and we worship the same Jesus. And yeah. it's just, it's really cool. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. I love that. And you think about God and all of the great diversity that we see mm-hmm. around the world. Mm-hmm. To me, what that shows is that there's great diversity within him. Yeah. And, you know, we have those people. I was with a friend the other day uh, at that God and Country Festival. Uh-huh, yeah. And he told me, this is a hard one for me because I don't like country music. Oh. So they play a lot of country music. I love country right? music. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> and so... 
But I think of, you think of all the different music genres mm-hmm. that are out there and how some people cannot stand some genres yeah. and completely love other ones. Mm-hmm. I feel like those genres are just another example of how God has this eclectic nature mm-hmm. to him where he really sees the beauty yeah. and understands the beauty in so many different things that mm-hmm. sometimes we miss. Yeah. But it shows his diversity. I mean, yeah. He could be the greatest country artist and the greatest rock artist, right. greatest blues artist and the greatest R&B artist and gospel artist, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, he can receive worship from those areas, mm-hmm. but then he can also minister through those in so many right. different ways. That's awesome. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your story. Um, so you said at 16, yeah. you uh, had this passion because did you say at 13, you started going to yep. church. Um, talk to me a little bit about just kind of before church and then going to church and what you felt like your like passion was, like what God put on put on your heart. So... I always have to preface this okay. with, I have an amazing family. Mm-hmm. I have, my my wife rarely talks about how she just loves her in-laws. She loves my side of the family. And we both feel the same way. We love each other's side of the families. We have great families. Yes. But when I was young, I regularly felt void of love. Mm. I felt like I... I I wasn't loved and I wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because you know how we'll say some people have old souls. Yeah. I regularly had that yeah. comment towards me. Okay. I have an old soul. I I was in what middle school maybe and I'd go to a restaurant with my mom and sit and listen to jazz music. <laughs> I love uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I regularly had that. And one of the the big burdens of that old soul was this feeling of and love is one of the most meaningful things in life. And I felt like I did not have that. Okay. And I desired that. Mm-hmm. And then so growing up, that was always a big struggle of mine. Um, I have fits of anger and fits of suicidal thoughts mm-hmm. and went through a lot of a lot of relationships and a lot of different things in life, really seeking that out. Yeah. And when I was at freshman in high school, my mom and I, we were staying in a motel room and my brother was staying with a friend and he invited me. I gave him excuses and he gave me an answer for every single one of them, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> which I'm, I'm telling you, that's one of that moment was probably the most impactful thing in my whole life really was that moment. And I don't know if my brother could even go back and recall that conversation. Really? I don't know if he thought much of it at that time, if he was comfortable having the conversation. Right. I mean, we were talking over the phone. He asked me, I gave him an excuse. He gave me an answer. I gave him another excuse. <laughs> he gave me an answer. And then I said, okay, I'll go. Yeah. And, and, you know, he came, got me and took me to that church and it radically changed my life Yeah. because... Pastor Mark was the pastor who was speaking Mm -hmm. at that time. And he was talking from 1 John chapter 4. Okay. And in 1 John chapter 4, John says how God is love. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can't remember one other word from that sermon. (laughs) Except for God is love. I cannot. I cannot remember one. I mean, I know it was, was, he was, it was stirring and, but it just almost night and day when he said those three words, Mm -hmm. it felt like, a lightning bolt just hit my heart. Yeah. And I knew right then that, okay, this is what I've been looking for. Yeah. This is what I need. And ended up, I, funny enough, I did not receive Christ into my life that first night. Okay. I was stubborn. Yeah, yeah, I mean. But that very next week, I was up at the altar. Okay. <laughs> you could like let it sink in. You have to be to, like, all right, right, Lord, but. Right. Right. We're cool. But <laughs> I'm going to wait and hold off. See if this yep. is the life for me. Exactly. And but yeah, I was up at the altar that very next week. And really from that from that moment on, because I was able to get into relationship with some other friends at that church, mm-hmm. we really spurred each other on. And, you know, we challenged each other to read regularly, pray regularly, worship regularly and and get involved in ministry. And so 
my life up to that point. I mean, I'm a freshman in high school. Yeah. I'm a young guy. I love sports. And so I've always thought about, okay, I want to go to college and play at this college for sports and see how far I can go. And um, it's funny, my brother will tell people, he used to always, I used to always carry a football around. No matter where I went, I had a football in my hands. Yeah, I just had, I had my football in my hands. And then over the course of high school, that football changed to me carrying my Bible around. That's cool. All the time. Yeah. And so it all through the years, well after high school, God was still working out a lot of kinks in me. Mm -hmm. But really that shift in my heart from I want to do this mm -hmm. to I want to know and serve him yeah. was the biggest thing. So you carrying a Bible around, that's something a pastor does. <laughs> no, right? <laughs> so you are a pastor. Um, yep. did, have you, did you always want to be a pastor, like from no. that moment? No, absolutely not. Okay. Uh. <laughs> At what point? So did you go to college and play sports? I did not. Okay. So by the time I graduated high school, I made the decision that I was going to pursue ministry. Okay. But it was, I want to say it was my junior year when I was 16. Mm -hmm. I graduated at 17. Okay. So it was my junior year. I was 16. And being involved at the church, having friends, you would, people would say things as far as, you know, maybe... Uh, uh, you're you're good at ministry, yeah. you're drawn to ministry. You're like you, you should, you yeah, you should what? be a pastor. Yeah. You know those those types of things. And I would always push back against that. Okay, always push back against it. But that it kept weighing more and more on my heart and stayed more and more in my head. Mm -hmm. And and people started saying that more and more. My pastor baptizes me and talks about how I'm going <laughs> to be a ministry. Be a ministry. Yeah. And so all the way, I'm kind of pushing back against it. But there was one day specifically, I was in my room and just struggling with that. And I'm sitting there and me and God are arguing mm -hmm. a little bit. Because <laughs> he argues. Right? Because he argue. he's gracious enough. Yeah, right? yeah to um, engage us. <laughs> exactly. I think as a parent, I'm not going to argue with my kid. Yeah. Yeah, he has that patience to uh -huh. where I'm saying, they're like, no, I'm not going to do it. Sorry. No, and then, right? <laughs> and and I remember in that that conversation, it, I, I came to this point where I said, okay, you know what? If this is the case, if you really want me to be a, be a pastor, if you want me to be a pastor, you want me to plant a church, then you're going to have to give me something. You're going to have to show me something. And I'm mm. thinking kind of like, you know, the, the fleece, right? Uh -huh. Like the Gideon. The, yeah. You're going to have to show me something. And I said, you know what? I want the name. I want the name of the church. And that's what I told. <laughs> I want the name of the church. And yeah. So I just defiantly. And then at, shortly after that, I'm sitting up and I'm reading my Bible. And I come across where, this, I always tell people this is my favorite Jesus, where Jesus is flipping tables, yeah, chasing yeah, people yeah, with yeah. the cord. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Favorite Jesus. Clearing out the clearing temple. Out the yeah. temple yeah. Clearing yeah. out the temple. And then in that, Jesus says, my house is to be a house of prayer. And he says, literally, my house is to be called a house of prayer. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I felt like my heart stopped. Mm -hmm. it, kind of like that moment where I said, it felt like a lightning bolt yeah. hit my chest. I, it almost felt like God reached into my chest and just grabbed my heart <laughs> and was just holding it. Yeah. And so it just felt like it stopped and I fell down to the floor. I was on my bed, I fell down to my knees and I said, okay, okay. Yeah. And then I just felt a release. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I could not look back. Yeah. Uh, I just knew from that moment, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be a pastor. So what did that journey look like? You did you, you went to seminary or no? So Bible I went college? down to I went to Bible college, uh, moved down to Texas, okay. yeah. and that's where I fell in love with country music. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where I fell in love with country music and picked up some patriotism. You can't, okay. you can't not do that in no, Texas, right? Not in Texas. And so fell in love with country music, which goes hand in hand with you're going to start hearing more patriotism. Uh -huh. And yeah. um, I ended up going down there for a discipleship program. Okay. So I wanted to go to college, but more so I wanted to prepare myself for ministry. So I went into a discipleship program down there and was at a Bible college, did some interning with a big church down there. And... From there, I just kind of kept going from one church 
to the next, interning, volunteering, and ended up joining the Air Force. Okay. Uh, joined the Air Force, and I was thinking— Was that uh, random? Like or- It wasn't completely random. Okay. So that actually came from—so love of country music, right? Yeah. Uh, and military. <laughs> and military. And your country right? and all of and the And so things. it was kind of a mixture of two things. <laughs> okay. I remember, I think my first year in that discipleship program, I remember— some of the students in that discipleship program having a debate mm-hmm. or or an argument. And I was defending the military okay. in that debate and argument. And then one of them said, why don't you join the military? And I said, oh, that's not for me. <laughs> I just said, that's not for me. I appreciate them. Like, that, I, yeah. I can never see myself doing that. Um, that's not for me. And it's funny because a few years down the road, I'm in the low of low in my life. Okay. At this point, I have I've fallen in love with country music. I'd go to Billy Bob's, Texas, which mm-hmm. is the world's largest honky tonk. I'd go over there and <laughs> I'd be dancing uh, regularly almost every Thursday night. Yeah. And um, so at this point in my life, I just went through a... Uh, can't even say a breakup. It was literally, I was going through divorce. Mm -hmm. I had ended up getting married with someone from that discipleship program. Mm -hmm. Things went south. Uh, There was infidelity, and then I was trying to work things out. And we we said we were going to try to work things out, but then the the affair that she was in Mm -hmm. continued to happen. Okay. And she said she wanted out, and she was done. And so... Heartbreaking. Very. Um, And at that point, it was absolutely one of the lows in my life because, again, I had this mindset of, I'm called to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm called to be in ministry. And if there was anything else, and you can probably kind of catch on from that idea of, I I sought love from very young. It was this idea of, I wanted to be a good husband and father. Yeah. Those were the two biggest goals in my life mm-hmm. was to be obedient and be in ministry and to be a good husband and father. Yeah. And with that, I felt like all of that was just dashed to pieces yeah. and there was no chance of me ever fulfilling those things. Right. I was thinking there's no way I can be a pastor now. Um, I've already, you know, I've ruined a marriage and yeah. odds are that's, you know, if you ruin you ruin the marriage, you're not going to have another successful one. For your and, divorce, and yeah. someone say that you were disqualified. Disqualified, just, you know, exactly. or whatever. So exactly. there's a lot of shame that probably comes with that. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And so I was in my low. Mm. Um, I was definitely just fighting suicidal thoughts, depression. I was really in a mode of self-sabotage. Yeah. If, if I'm being honest, I would do things that I know I shouldn't be doing, and mm-hmm. I would um, really push back on any progression mm-hmm. almost as I didn't deserve it. I didn't even want to, to move forward. And I was in that low, and I don't know what it is about God meeting me in my bedroom, Mm -hmm. but uh, (laughs) it's quiet, right? It's It's quiet. It's it's, personal. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm again, I'm sitting on my bed and me and him are talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember coming to this point of, and honestly, I really think it was after I, I had a good thing going for me with a fitness organization I was working for. Okay. And then I made a big mistake and I felt like I blew it with them mm. too. And so, okay, everything's just done. Yeah. And it was later that I want to say that week, it was at nighttime, me and God were were talking again and I came to this point of saying, okay, if I can never have any of these things, mm-hmm. if I if I'm, you know, disqualified and I can never be a minister, mm-hmm. if I never have a, a wife or a child again, mm-hmm. I will serve you how I can. You just surrendered it. Yeah. I, said, I, will, I will seek after you and I will serve you how I can. And from that point, it's not like it was a complete, you know, the light switch came on. Right. And, and your life was great. You know, and the life, perfect, no. yeah. But oddly enough... It was probably later that same month I 
go out to California to visit my mom mm-hmm. for Mother's Day. And she wasn't there. Mm. Um, I went to surprise her. Oh, no. And <laughs> surprise. Yeah, so surprise. She's not, she's not even here. Um, <laughs> Joke's on you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I run in to a, a friend, my, my friend's girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, and talking with her. And she says, oh, you're going into the Air Force because I had signed up for mm-hmm. the Air Force at that point. And... I think that's kind of, I kind of rabbit trailed. No, you're good. But the reason I signed up was when I was in that low. Yeah. I. New direction. New, well, I was, I was walking around. I just left the job interview. Yeah. I knew that wasn't good. And I saw an army recruiting office mm-hmm. and my, the literally word for word, the thought that went through my mind was if I die, I die. I just mm-hmm. didn't care anymore. Yeah. And so I walked in and started asking about, you know, signing up and, looked into different branches. My uncle was very upset that I didn't pick the Navy because he was a Navy <laughs> officer. Um, but it was actually somebody in that fitness organization that I worked for. He was a Marine. Got it. And he worked with all the branches and he's, mm-hmm. he recommended Air Force. Yeah. And I, I liked what they had to offer, ended up going with the Air Force. Okay. But because of that, I run into my my sister now. Yeah. I, I run into her and she says, oh, my sister is in the Air Force. Maybe she could give you some pointers. Do you mind if I give her your contact? And then mm-hmm. so she strong arms pretty much her sister, uh-huh. which is now my wife, yeah. into contacting me. And she's saying, like, I told him you would contact him and give yeah. him some pointers. So now you need and to. Then, yeah, so now you need to. And from that, she texted me and then we just never stopped talking. Wow. Um, from that... I don't think a day went by from that time to the time I got in to basic military training that we didn't talk to one another. Yeah. And and so it's funny because earlier that month I was, you know, running from God and I was uh, in that self-sabotage mode and I had that breakdown. And then it just seems like after I said, okay, no matter what it is, mm-hmm. no, I mean, maybe I'll never fulfill these things, see these things in my life, but I'll serve you however I can. And mm-hmm. later that month, he brings my future wife. That's am- mix. It's amazing. And I feel like that's happened so many times yeah. in my life where I'm fighting with God. Really, I'm fighting with myself because the Lord right? is like, come on, kid, <laughs> like, get it together. Exactly. Um, but like I'm I'm wrestling with God about stuff and tr- or trying to control, right? Yes. And Um, Not that you were necessarily controlling, but to a point, it was like you were trying to control an outcome, right? Because you wanted to be passive. But everything was spiraling, right? And you lost your wife and, you know, you thought you lost any chance at this career. And and it just was like, fine, give up. Mm -hmm. Um, That you had to get to this place of surrender. And I feel like that's just so funny how the Lord works where he's like, I'm going to let you fight this out. (laughs) Let you go ahead and figure this out. Until we get to a point where we're like, okay, like the Lord just wants our yes. Like he just wants our surrender and he just wants our heart and our yes to just say, okay, like I'm done trying to like Mm -hmm. figure out the outcome. I'm I'm done trying to do that. And I feel like that's when he just loves to redeem the story and he loves to just come in and and say, but look what I can do. Like, look what I can do. Something that came to mind while you were talking um, is, so you were talking about how you were, you know, wrestling with the Lord and um, you we're going through this divorce and you were going through, like you were at the lowest point and like so many things had happened. You were at the lowest point making decisions, what you were dancing, you were, not that dancing's bad, but (laughs) but, you know, you were like, and you were kind of going down this road of like, fine, I'll go to the military. I'll go, you know, Uh, whatever. And during all of this season, you still loved Jesus. Yeah. Like that we can simultaneously love Jesus and maybe not be pursuing him as fervently or it looks different, but you love Jesus. You believe in what the Bible says. You are a Christ follower and you were still struggling and you were still walking through hard times and you were, you know, and so um, I think oftentimes, I know I've heard it like, you know, this picture. That's why I think it's really important when we share our stories that um, we talk about the hard too, because being a Christ follower doesn't mean that our life is perfect. And then God redeemed everything. Exactly. <laughs> and like, you know, and then it's wrapped in a bow and it was a really happily ever after because while we know we have hope in Christ and we die, mm-hmm. that we will have a happily ever after, we will have 
a perfect ending. Exactly. It's not going to be here on earth. And we may never see the redemption this side of heaven. Mm-hmm. And but, but if we trust his promises, right? And so it's super important to like, no, but life's still messy. Yeah. And that we can simultaneously love Jesus and walk through. Absolutely. The junk, you know? Absolutely. That, that reminds me, there's a saying that I'll often share is that this earth, this mm-hmm. world, this life, mm-hmm. this is as good as it gets for the unbeliever. Yeah but this is as bad as it gets for the believer. Yeah, that's powerful. And, and so it's it's interesting because we're going to have such great highs and lows in our lives, mm-hmm. no matter where you're at in relationship mm-hmm. with God. You're going, Jesus says, you're going to have troubles yeah. in this life. Yeah. And, but the question is, is does it go up from here or does mm-hmm. it go down? Yeah. I mean, if this is the worst it's ever going to be for me, right. Because, like, there are great days, you know? Like, exactly. if this is the worst it's ever going to be, man, <laughs> s- sign me up. Like, <laughs> you know? There you go, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So, you met your wife. Oh, yes. And you were married. <laughs> Best thing the Air Force did. That's which amazing. Air Force was great. Right. But, I mean, you can't. But you're not in the Air Force anymore. I'm not. And not. I'm still married. <laughs> and you're still married. So, I mean, bonus, right? Go. Win. Yep. Um, and your wife was in the Air Force. Yes, she was. And she's not anymore either. She's not. Okay. And she was a much better airman than I was. <laughs> I mean, I, I just have to give it. No, I, I just have to give. We we were both doing very well in our careers, but if you want to talk about the model airman, like she was it. A recruiter would take her ten times out of ten over me. I love that. I, if they could look at our Air Force career and say, "Okay, you're gonna have somebody like this. Yeah, you're gonna have somebody like this ten times out of ten. I love it. They're gonna take her. That's cool. She was just stellar. That's awesome. Absolutely stellar. So you're married. You have how many kids? We have two. You have two. We have two, two daughters. Two daughters. Yes. So you you are a husband and you are a father. Yes. And I mean, I don't really know, but I would imagine that you're probably a great husband and a great father. I try to be. Two things that you, <laughs> right. I mean, and, yes. and perfection can never be attained, right? No. Nope. Um, I'd imagine that your wife would say, you know, probably yes. Hey, she's she's sticking with me. Right? <laughs> she could do a lot better, but she's sticking with me. <laughs> I just won't leave that alone. <laughs> um, but those are two things that were really important to you. Yes. That you were. Absolutely. And how incredible that God redeemed something that you thought was completely yeah. lost completely and not lost. No, so. yes. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, my wife and my girls, um, <laughs> especially my, so my eight-year-old, mm-hmm. I feel like, especially over this past year, she may feel like I've been hard on her. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. She actually had a little airtime with, I think, Project 88.7. Okay. Cause she, yeah, the radio station. Yeah, she did one of the little fills where she said, That's this cool. is Aria and you're listening to Project 88.7. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so it's just, that made her day. Of course was, it did. So that was a highlight. But I'm so proud of those girls. Yeah. I mean, you. there are some things where we we look at our lives and we have to realize, okay, if not for God, mm-hmm. there's there's no way I could have ever imagined having these two girls that I have. Yeah. Just how amazing they are. Yeah. And then same thing with my wife. I mean, if I were to write down, you know, what I wanted in a notebook and turn it over and somebody hand it to me, mm-hmm. um, then I wouldn't have ended up with a better, the better wife yeah. that I have now. That's awesome. And so... God, God knows a little better than we do. Right. Always. <laughs> Always. But and it's just it amazes me that it amazes me that he's entrusted me. Yeah. With these three girls. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to touch on one thing real quick. So you're a pastor of a church called Limitless. Yes. In Boise, Idaho, or in yeah. the Boise, Idaho area. Yep. And um that is, I kind of want to talk about this idea real quick about it's not a traditional. No. Church. It's a it's a micro church. It's a micro church. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about uh, that micro church. Tell me about that. So there are there's multiple micro churches mm-hmm. here in the Boise area and all throughout America. Right. It's very, pretty it's, it's gaining traction and yes. becoming more and more popular. It is. And we have a a small group that meets in our home. Mm-hmm. And this idea of micro church really is an aspect of we're going to 
pull everything back to what we call the three basic necessities mm-hmm. of the church, which is we are going to be in fellowship with one another. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have, you know, we like to say relationships that change lives. Mm-hmm. We're going to have life-changing Christian relationships with one another, edifying, mm-hmm. encouraging one another, yep. and, you know, doing life together. Mm-hmm. And then we have worship. Yep. And then we are on mission together. And so those are the three things that we say, okay, this is what makes a church. Yeah. Fellowship, worship, and being on mission. And so that is our big focus is we'll come together we meet in our home, mm-hmm. um, very simple, laid back, very soft start, very mm-hmm. soft end <laughs> yeah, yeah. every Sunday. And we come together, we eat, and we'll, we'll a lot of times sing a hymn. Mm-hmm. We'll a lot of times join in different prayers together. We'll get into the Word and we read at least a chapter together. Mm-hmm. And then we just talk about how that, how what we're seeing in it, how we can apply it to our lives. And we challenge each other to be on mission Mm -hmm. and we encourage each other in that. And we actually gave everyone this this year, we gave everyone a month where they would have someone they're trying to draw into relationship with God. Mm. And they have that month where we're going to surround them with support and prayer. And so we set aside funds and we said... Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to take them to a concert, here's the money for the concert. Yeah. If you want to throw a party, here's some money for the party and we'll come. And, yeah. You know, we'll be there to help bring this person into relationship. That's awesome. So. That's so cool. So um, how can somebody find out about my, like yeah. your microchurch and like yeah. this um, idea? So our microchurch, it's, it's funny because we are almost just so it's just socially connected okay we have a website okay so it's at live limitless dot church okay and that's a way that you can reach out and we can reach okay. out to you and uh get you connected but you can't really just look it up on google okay <laughs> you're not really googleable <laughs> we're not googleable or anything um you're not gonna see big advertisements yeah. or anything like that a lot of it's just us knowing people, yeah. getting to know our neighbors. Our churches, and, and it's yep. organic and it's... And inviting people, yeah. How some of the early church did it and how people gathered in homes and, and spur each other Absolutely. on that way. Well, And t- again, that's to me one of the most amazing things that you see in the early church. Mm-hmm. You think of what we have now in comparison to what they had then mm-hmm. and the rapid growth that they had. And not just growth as in how many people started calling themselves believers. Right. But really the spiritual growth mm-hmm. and dynamic, the way that the kingdom of God was alive and active mm-hmm. in the early church and moving through so many people, that all happened through word of mouth. Yeah. They didn't have social media. They didn't have social media. Yeah. What what it was, was everyone was doing their part. Yeah. They were working together. Mm-hmm. They were united. Mm-hmm. And Full that's what happens. <laughs> and that's what happens. That's what the, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's what we need as a church. If yeah. everyone is doing their part, mm-hmm. everyone's taking on that mission and we're encouraging each other, nothing in the world can stop God's church. Yeah. Nothing. Preach. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. Well, um, we will put that website in the show notes. So anybody interested in yeah. Microchurch and Limitless and yeah. kind of what that's all about and Absolutely. you guys, like they'll be able to go find that. Yeah. And can I do a shameless plug? Absolutely. I would also say there's, there is an organization here in the Boise area mm-hmm. and it's called The Syndicate. Okay. And I know it's a funny name when the, one of the reasons— I've heard of it. Right? It's yeah. One of the reasons is because people always think, isn't that like the mafia or something? <laughs> like, mm, yeah. Well, and it's this idea of a lot of times microchurches are called underground churches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's this idea, it's an underground network. It's, yeah. And so we, we call it the syndicate, and it is a group— of microchurches that really help resource and yeah. train and we do events together. And so that anyone interested in microchurches in the the Idaho area mm-hmm. or in the world, honestly, that's something to look into and okay. you'll find some great resources there, just a rabbit trail into getting connected with microchurches. That's cool. Especially because it's I think it's worth noting like these aren't just like um they're not um 
they're not like groups that aren't held accountable anywhere. They're oh, like, they're not just yeah. like random exactly. gatherings. Like there's accountability. These are churches. Exactly. You are like, you are doing church. Yeah. It just, it just looks different. Like we talked exactly. about the, yeah. under unity, not uniformity. <laughs> um, yes. So yeah. Okay. That's exactly. awesome. Um, yeah. People can find that in yeah. the show notes. So we'll make sure you can scroll down and go check that out. Cool. Um, one last question. Yeah. Um, I ask all my guests this um, kind of in light of their own story, but I know because of what you said that, you know, there came a point where you just thought, man, like, I can't do what I felt like God was calling me to do. And, um, you know, it took a minute to see that redemption. Mm -hmm. What would you give, what kind of encouragement would you give somebody who wants to be a leader or maybe who is, who's a pastor where they want to give up or they feel like they're in this place of like, where's my redemption going to happen? Exactly. And they feel maybe depleted or discouraged or yeah. whatever. Um, but but specifically like pastors and leaders who are called to this mm -hmm. high calling, what encouragement would you, would you have for them? Uh, I would say two things. Okay. Um, one, go back to ministering out of the overflow of your personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I think so often, especially in today's culture, we'll have a lot of, a lot of burnout yeah. um, and we'll have a lot of struggles that ministers are facing in the dark mm -hmm. and trying to juggle so much and trying to figure things out and sort it all out in your, on your own. Mm -hmm. If you can just get back to focusing on your relationship with God and letting your ministry come out of an overflow of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your messages are coming out of the overflow of your personal time yeah. and relationship. The, the things that you're giving to others are coming as an overflow and you just focus on that relationship. Yeah. That often we'll talk about bring us back to where we started, right? Yeah. Bring us back to that, that pure and that first love. It has to go there. Yeah. We have to have that strong connection, a healthy relationship with God and making sure that we are in a good place with Him. Right. And then secondly, get out of isolation. Yeah. I, I do not know one person who has gone through times of struggle and trial, depression, burnout, and those times, types of things and not felt isolated, mm -hmm. not felt like they're alone, others don't understand, get out of isolation. Yeah, We need to surround ourselves with other members of the body who can understand, who know what we're going through, who know what's going through our head mm -hmm. and be able to encourage one another. Yeah, uh, The enemy loves working in the dark. A hundred percent. I mean, if we if we keep things in the dark, that's that's where he loves to keep things. That's yep. where he tries to fight us. As soon as it comes out to the light, yep. if we're able to put it in the light and have others come at it with us and and work on those things with us, then again, the enemy can't stop that. Right. And yeah. And the enemy wants to keep you believing that you are oh, isolated absolutely. and that you are alone and that nobody understands. Yep. And um, yeah. Yeah. So... Well, thank you so much, Nathaniel. I appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate you <laughs> being here and sharing your story. And um, you. yeah, this was awesome. Thank this you so much. A great time. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation on the Stories Unveiled podcast. We would love it if you would leave us a rating or review. If you would like to learn more about Stories Unveiled and our events, go to storiesunveiledconference.com or follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Stories Unveiled underscore. The Stories Unveiled podcast is created in partnership with KTSY and Barefoot Media Ministries. For more encouragement and other podcasts, visit ktsy.org. Have an incredible day and go live unveiled.